Welcome, welcome to Green Drinks. My name is Ginevra. I'm the program director at Sustainable Woodstock. We were founded in 2009 and we're a nonprofit community and environmental action and education organization building on Woodstock's legacy as birthplace of the modern conservation movement. So we are so excited to have you at one of our monthly green drinks. These are social events to connect people with similar interests. We invite nonprofits, businesses, individuals, anyone who's interested in sustainability, and we invite experts to make short presentations highlighting their sustainability or green initiatives, either in our area, in Vermont, or sometimes more broadly. So it's a really fun, exciting way to share our community's knowledge um, and like I said, we have them every month. You'll find them on our website or on our Eventbrite page. So our next green drinks, this is the part where I do plug um, the green drinks for next month. It's going to be a little earlier in the month because of the holidays. It's going to take place on December 8th and it will be on green burial. So now that the cat is out of the bag on the disastrous environmental repercussions, um, that are inherent in a lot of conventional vault burials and cremations. People are eager to find ways to dispose of our bodies after death that are dignified, affordable, and eco-conscious. Join us as we explore the facts about burial plus initiatives that are in the works to solve this very real part of our global problem. So that again is going to be December 8th and I'll send out the link to register to everyone who is at tonight's event. For tonight, we have Ben Kogan with Reusable Solutions. Before we get started, I want to just run through how the meeting's operating right now. You are muted. Um, if you have questions as we go, please type those into the chat, and we can always unmute you later to allow you to ask them to Ben um, in person. If you haven't used the chat and you want to check it out, you'll want to just run your cursor over the screen and you'll see a little chat icon that allows you to open it. If you don't see that, click on the dot, 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 more symbol, and that'll open up a wider screen where you can select chat. So you can see what others are typing in the chat and you can enter things as well. Um, otherwise, we'll have a little time for Q&A, hopefully a good amount of time for Q&A at the end. I'll follow up with any info or contact info that Ben would like me to share. And I think that um, I think that summarizes it all pretty well. So I'll go ahead and introduce you, Ben. Ben Kogan is an environmental entrepreneur, music teacher, and dad living in the village of Woodstock. He runs a company called Reusable Solutions, whose mission is to eradicate single-use plastic and break free, free from fossil fuels. The most current and relevant projects are the Vermont Can Carrier Reuse Program and the Band Pledge for Sustainable Concerts. He moved here from Park Slope, Brooklyn in 2021 with his wife and son. Okay, I will, I'll stop now and hand it over to you, Ben. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ginevra. Um, you have a, you have a great voice that I think you should start a podcast. I think it's, uh, I don't know if anyone has ever said that to you before, but uh, I think you have a future. Oh. In that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I would play a, little, a quick little theme song because I have the skill that I'm going to use. This is my, my theme song I started on the show, Zero Waste Wednesdays. All right, welcome everybody to Supporting Zero Waste in Vermont. Uh, thanks so much for being here. This is a great crowd. I'm used to talking to one or two people, so this is uh, quite an improvement. Uh, we're going to start uh, this by talking about um, the definition of zero waste. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Uh, zero waste. And we right. can see your, like the whole screen. I mean, you could just, it depends on what you want to do. You can share yeah. like, yeah. Uh, that's, that's good, yeah. Um, it's, it's your whole screen, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. All right, uh, zero waste definition. Zero waste is a goal that is ethical, economical, efficient, and visionary to guide people in changing their lifestyles and practices to emulate sustainable natural cycles where all discarded materials are designed to be resources for others to use. Um, that being said, it is a goal, and the way that 
we have known for a long time about achieving that goal are the three R's. Um, do you guys know what the three R's are? I can see you mouthing them. Yes. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Uh, we spent the last 30 years on the last R, um, recycle at the behest of plastic companies. So I'm going to quickly outline this talk here, um, is that we're, uh, I'm going to explain why recycling isn't working and how we can work on the previous R, which is reuse. Um, as far as, uh, as for questions, um, you know, you may have questions as things come up, uh, I'd suggest writing them down. Uh, I'm going to stop in the middle uh, to answer any questions that you have just uh, briefly, and then we'll have more questions at the end. Okay, we're going to talk about why why recycling isn't working. Um, well, it's incredibly complicated, but uh, you know that answer is not satisfying. I'm going to attempt to explain why. Recycling was never designed to solve the problem. It was only intended to give the illusion of a solution so plastic companies could continue producing and selling new plastic. And of course, get the pesky environmentalists off their backs, like sustainable Woodstock. Um, but we need to work on something new here. So uh, let's, I'm gonna, if you guys, you know, if somebody wants to raise their hand here, I would like to know um, what you guys do for recycling and compost in the area. Can we have a brave volunteer to tell me what they do? You just unmute yourself and just, you can just say it. Any, any takers? Hi, Ben. Yes, this is Nina and West Fairly. Honestly speaking, we just take it to our recycling center, our recyclables, and we do have two compost bins that we use because I'm a gardener. Great. Thank you for being brave. I appreciate that. Um, your recycling center, I just haven't asked some questions. Is that like the Hartford transfer station? Is that what you're talking about? No, it's West Fairly. Okay, cool. But you go over there. Is it sort like, what is yes. yeah, what does it look like there? It's not it's single sort. It's um, there's plastics. There's cardboard, um, there's glass, glass aluminum. there's aluminum and metals. And then they just recently upgraded our recycle, our transfer station, I should call it. Um, and they added a textile bin. Um, there is a compost station, which I don't utilize because I have my own at home. Um, and there's battery, battery recycling. Cool, well, that's great. So. Just to recap, there's like it's a fairly big space, and you separate all the materials yourself, and you put them in different bins. Is that right? Yes, and then also just in as, as an aside, I am fortunate enough to have additional access to recycling capabilities um, at Hypertherm because I work there, and they are aiming for zero um, waste. Mm -hmm. So we have additional recycling for pens, for rigid plastic, soft plastics, compost. It, it's much more broader. And uh, is that just through your work or can anybody access that? No, that's just through my work. Okay, cool. Well, that's good. That's good to know. There's people working on it. Um, anyone here um, I get like a pickup service from Casella or um, Nordic Waste Services? Jump in if uh, you guys do that. Hey, this is Emily from Wayridge. I get a pickup service from Casella for recyclables. Um, I live on a farm, so I compost on farm. And then for plastic film recycling, I have to physically take it to the local district transfer station, which is the Addison County Solid Waste Management District. Okay, great. So for your recyclables, you uh that are not plastic film you put it in a bin right at home and casella comes and picks it up like once a week or every other week correct every two weeks cool um great so i'm gonna go to the next part of this talk which is oh. what happens after you put it in the blue bin or the green bin for recycling so um like nina was saying a little bit earlier that you know uh, if you bring it to your transfer station, you have to separate it yourself. It's, it's uh, lots of sort, right? Uh, with Casella, they call it zero sort. That's zero sort for you, but it's lots of sort for them. Um, and let's go through that journey and see what that looks like. Uh, can you guys see the Casella 
picture there. You have to say yes or no because I can't. I can't. I see. Can. All right, yes. great. Here we go. So this is what happens uh, with Casella. Um, like after it. All right. So after you put it in your bin, it goes to what's called a MRF, and a MRF uh, is a not such a exciting name, but uh, it's, it rhymes with Smurf, which is slightly more exciting. And uh, it stands for Materials Recovery Facility. So what they do is that they bring the materials to that facility and then they sort them. And it looks something like this. Casella Zero Sort Recycling has made it easy for you to do your part to protect our environment by putting all of your recyclables into one container. But before they can become new products, they still need to be separated. And this is how we do it. The recycling is driven to the nearest material recovery facility, otherwise known as a MRF. When it arrives at the facility, all of the recyclables are dumped onto the tipping floor. A loader pushes the material onto the main upfeed belt as it makes its way to the pre-sort area. During pre-sort, large bulky items and non-acceptable material is manually removed from the conveyor. The material makes its way to a three-deck cardboard screen. The larger cardboard surfs over the top of the discs, while material smaller than 8 inches falls through the discs and moves onward for further processing. Once the material falls through, the first priority is to extract the glass using a glass breaker disc screen. So after this whole process, then they're separating it into different parts, and then they go, go to bail it. Um, and then they give the bale, they're, they're essentially selling the bale to someone that can use it. So the baling part is here, it's pretty cool. Now that all the various materials have been separated, it's time to make them into bales. The baler compresses the material into cubes called bales and straps them. Each bale weighs between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds. These bales are stored in our warehouse and are now ready to be shipped and made into new products. So that is a bit of uh, what the journey looks like. And then after all that happens, um, they have to sell it to someone that buys these different products. Now this part is going to be a bit of a bummer, but then I'm going to lift you guys up again later and show you there is there's light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, recycling rates by material. A cardboard box. This has the best recycling rate out of any material. Um, it is a 96.5 recycling rate. That is really good. I would take that on a test for sure. Um, some other studies show that if you use paper as a, uh, excuse me, if you use paper, uh, the recycling rate for paper in general, when you start to include like envelopes or, you know, scrap paper, printer paper, magazines, newspapers, uh, that brings the average down closer to like 60%. But uh, cardboard box is, is really high. So I think that as far as, uh, you know, is recycling working or not, um, cardboard box, box recycling is working. Uh, moving on to the next one, aluminum cans. 52% of cans, aluminum cans are recycled. That's, you know, a lot less than 96.5, but if you look further down the line here, it's, uh, it's better than a lot of the other items. Glass has a 25% recycling rate. And then plastic, plastic, 6%. It's really low. And I want to tell you, uh, tell you a little bit about why it's so low. The plastic recycling is incredibly complicated. I left some of my props downstairs, but I have some of them with me. I got, I got two types of plastic over here. Um, I don't know how to ask a question because I don't see hand raised, but I just wanted to ask about those percentages. Could I do that? Sure. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm Brenda. I'm living in Thetford. And so I understand that plastic 6%, is that... 6% of all the plastics produced in the world, or is that 6% of what actually goes into, say, Casala's hopper and comes out as, what? what is that? What's the- Yeah, that's of all plastic generated that okay. actually gets recycled. Thank you for explaining, that's it. Sure, yeah. We're gonna open up for more questions later, but um, but yeah, but that's that's the answer to that question. Uh, we'll stop, but write it, write it down so you don't forget. Um, types of plastics. Plastic recycling is very complicated because there are seven different types of plastic. Um, each of them have their own value at the end of this, uh, at the end of the recycling chain. So number one, it's actually pretty funny. I do these demonstrations from time to time and I don't have much plastic in my life. 
So I've, I've tried to like eradicate it from uh, my own life. So finding samples, I have to like buy a plastic bottle for research or for, for the presentation. Um, but anyways, number one, PET is highly recyclable. Uh, it's, that's usually what you get with a, uh, with like a, a, a water bottle, like a plastic water bottle is usually made of PET. Um, number two is a polyethylene, high density polyethylene. And I'll talk more about these later. So this material is, um, this, these are the can carriers that you guys might know about. Um, you see them on the tops of beer for example purposes. Uh, this is number two, which is high density polyethylene. And this material is highly recyclable. These are not recyclable for reasons I'll get into a little bit later, but this is number two plastic. Uh, number three plastic is PVC. That's just definitely not recyclable. It is toxic in the certain temperature and conditions. So um, it's, it's very hard to recycle that one. Uh, low density polyethylene is, uh, I have it somewhere else, but um, like a bread bag or uh, there are some other, some other types, but like a bread bag is a good, uh, it's any plastic film, like a saran wrap is usually a poly low density polyethylene. Fun fact is ketchup bottles um, are actually tend to be um, low density polyethylene. Those um, are generally not recyclable. You actually, oh, plastic bags, that's like another one that's uh, low, density, low density polyethylene. You should not put your plastic bags in the recycling because it, um, it jams up the machines. So that's why you have to collect them separately. There's a few stores in the upper valley that you can bring them back for recycling like uh shaw's uh shaw's in white uh sorry in Le west leb and then hannaford's also has a plastic recycling uh for the film um those are usually turned into trex decking which is like a composite decking uh made up of wood like it's like sawdust and plastic and uh it's very durable so there is some good news there um Okay, number five, polypro uh, polypropylene, uh, like this, like a, um, a yogurt container. This is um, fairly recyclable, but at the end of the day, someone needs to buy these materials. Um, and if there's no market for it, or for recycled plastic, then people are not going to buy them uh, to get them recycled. So you're always, you know, competing against the price of oil and demand for recycled materials. Um, number six is polystyrene. So that's what people might know as a uh, styrofoam. Um, styrofoam, you can get it both in like, a, if you've seen like takeout clamshells, like those clear plastic containers, that can be polystyrene. Um, but also styrofoam is another um, example of that. That's nobody there. I know there are some collections. I think Ham might be on, on this call. There are some collections for this, but if you put it in your... Um, in your curbside recycling, nobody's recycling it. It's, we should, it, just in general, we should stop using polystyrene, um, rigid plastic, because there is no market for it. So that's that. And then this last one, number seven, this is like, uh, um, if you think about uh, like compostable, this is like others. So like um, compostable packaging, like a, like a plastic compostable cup, those are not recyclable. It's easy to think that they might be recyclable, but they're actually not recyclable. So when you put it in your recycling bin, it contaminates the batch and makes the batch uh, less valuable. So um, now that I've sufficiently bummed you out, um, oh, actually I'm not done bumming you out. I have one more thing. Even when recycling works, um, it still is not great for the environment. Um, just, I just want you to think about this process here, is that first you put it into the recycling bin, a diesel truck comes and picks it up and brings it to the MRF. That's carbon emissions. Uh, a MRF separates materials into bales, like we saw in that video. That's carbon emissions. Bales get shipped to the processor to convert to raw materials. That's carbon emissions. Processor ships to the packaging manufacturer. That's carbon emissions. Packaging company molds materials into new recycled plastic packaging. Carbon emissions. Packaging gets shipped to the product manufacturer to be filled. That's carbon emissions. Product manufacturer ships it to the distribution center or retail store. That's carbon emissions. So recycling is not that great for the environment. Um, the thing that we should be doing and be spending most of our time focusing on is reuse. 
Um, it is the second R for a reason. It's in that order, reduce, reuse, recycle. I'm not saying recycling is all in all bad, but it should only uh, be for a small percentage of things that can't be reused anymore. It should be the last step in the process. So we choose to reuse. Um, all right, so four examples of reuse. Reusable glass milk containers. Shopping at co-ops, like uh, um, up here we have the Upper Valley Food Co-op. Out in the western, northwest part of the state, we have Middlebury Food Co-op, and there's lots of co-ops. I think there's maybe more co-ops per capita here than any other place in America. Um, reusable coffee cups for cafes and reusable can carriers. So we're going to go with this first one here. Reusable glass milk containers. Um, there's two around here that are widely that are widely available. That's McNamara Dairy and Stratford. Um, I can confirm availability myself uh, for these at Max, Upper Valley Food Co-op, Woodstock Farmers Market, Gillingham's, Jake's, excuse me, Jake's Queechee Market, and the South Royalton Food Co-op. So, um, if you're wondering what it looks like. It looks a little something like this. This is not, they, I couldn't, I've been searching for days, maybe weeks to try to find a good uh, like example of it actually being washed and reused. But um, this is not them, but they're doing the same kind of thing. So, you know, I, anyone that has ever bought milk in these glass containers, they are being reused. And this is like something that everyone here can plug into at, um, and anywhere. It's like, we don't have to rebuild it. We just have to use it. And so here we go. This is what uh, this is more or less what it looks like. Our philosophy of doing things as our philosophy of doing things as nature intended also applies to the glass bottles that are used. Instead of further adding to landfills, we collect, sanitize, and reuse our half-gallon bottles. You only need to return them to any location that sells Hartzler's milk, and you'll receive your deposit back. The bottles will be picked up by our drivers to take back to our plant and be reused. Uh, I love that video. Someone found it for me today and I just put it in. Okay. Um, does anyone, let me open it up to some questions so far. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, you can probably do like two or three questions so far about what we've covered. Uh, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it. Um, if there's no questions, I'll uh, keep going here. I, I have a, this is Nina, another Nina, a different one. I'm actually okay. sitting in Houston, Texas, um, oh, cool. but we have a place up in the Sunapee, so that's how I found out about y'all. Okay. Um, I'm curious about the uh, plastic bags that you mentioned, because, you know, as, as you said, Hannaford's and Shaw's and a variety of, you know, grocery stores around the nation do take those, and Amazon loves to encourage people to return their plastic uh, sleeves from all the shipping that we've had these last years. But but what actually happens to that stuff? Yeah. So, I mean, I've the only research that I've been able to do, um, I've actually called the supermarkets and they've told me that it happens. I don't have, I'm not like a regulator or anything. I can't, I, I like no one's brought me on the truck. I would like to, by the way, <laughs> brought me on the truck and show me like what happens. Um, but pretty much, uh, it, for mo for the most part, um, it sounds like it, it turns it into composite lumber, which is uh, it's like sawdust and um, and plastic, and they fuse that together, and they can create this like long lasting composite lumber. So that's what everybody's telling me. You can use it for benches. You can use it for uh, like for decking, like you know, on a deck on your house, something like that. And Ben, there's a question in the chat as well. Should the returnable milk bottles be returned with the top? Right, that's a good one. Some, uh, all right, around here, um, I don't think they have any system in place to use the tops. Those tops, unfortunately, um, they're, all right, so when it goes to that, I showed you guys the video of the Merck before, um, is that when it, like, they're separating all these materials, the, uh, if it's under two inches wide, it falls through the cracks and that's considered residue and that's stuff that just gets thrown out. So if you're asking what you should do today, um, you should throw the cap out. 
but uh, there is a place. Oof, okay, it's, I can tell you it's somewhere in the U.S. I can tell you that much. Uh, there's a place somewhere in the U.S. that you can return it with a cap on, and they have their own um, source separated uh, system that they will get the caps recycled. Because the big thing is what happens here is that uh, if things are too small, uh, okay, all the problems happen when it goes to the MRF, which is the uh, Materials Recovery Facility. And if the item is too small, then it falls through the cracks. But if they're already separated ahead of time, uh, then that's not really a problem because that's an, it doesn't have to go to the MRF. So short answer around here, um, you you should throw it out, or better yet, try to get on McNamara Dairy or Stratford about setting up these systems. I can probably help too. I I, I have some connections with the waste management people, um, but yeah, for now, throw it out. But maybe we can change it. I don't know if you see it. Thanks, Ben. I don't know if you see in the chat, but Fred says, I've been saving these tops since 2020 or 2002. Oh my God, Fred. <laughs> I have a lot of plastic tops for an artist. Great. Um, okay. Uh, the listservs are great places to get the word out about some of these things. Um, I've gotten rid of lots of items and gotten lots of items from the listserv that maybe an artist, that's a lot. You know, what's funny is that um, these can carriers, I started this can carrier reuse program that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, people have just been saving these for years. And like, it's shocking to me that people just have stacks of them and they've been like waiting for something to happen. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, I hope that answers your question. Um, all right, cool. We're going to keep going over here. Um, I'm afraid to look at the chat because I have my system here with the, all these different windows open at the same time. Um, anyway, back to milk. Oh, I forgot about this cool picture here. Uh, it doesn't have much to do with around here, but I found this fun picture of this guy in England with uh, a reusable milk container. All right, moving on. Bulk shopping at food co-ops. Um, so some examples around here really any food co-op is uh, dry goods like oatmeal, rice, couscous, and nuts. You can, you can bring your own container to the co-op and then uh, fill it with whatever you want. I, I mean, uh, like a mason jar, is it, uh, there's a company called Classico that does um, tomato sauce. I have been able to reuse all their jars and like wash them out, clean them out nice, and then bring them to a food co-op and fill up. Uh, fill it up with any of these dry goods. So you can avoid packaging altogether um, by by shopping bulk at a food co-op. Uh, some specialties like in Vermont or maple syrup. I have a fun video to show you right after this of my son involved with this program. Uh, personal care, soap, pan soap, dish soap, laundry detergent. You can use, they, a lot of times they have bulk, um, bulk options at the co-op and you can fill up there. Produce, you can bring your own bag or no bag at all. And other items like spices, tea, honey, coffee, or peanut butter are all fairly widely available at co-ops throughout Vermont. So moving over to this next window. All right, so this is what it might look like. Uh, this is at the Rutland Food Co-op. Um, you can see all these different kinds of rices, uh, dried beans, things of that nature. Uh, Okay, this is a fun thing to talk about. I never get to talk about this with an audience. Um, certain items, I think, work better with packaging or without it. Kale, I don't really want to put kale straight in the, into like a cart or into a box because I feel like, uh, like dirt or dust or whatever can get on there. Um, I found there are these cloth, uh, there are these cloth produce bags. They are, um, I think Net Zero Co. is the company that makes it. You can get them anywhere. Um, certain items that like might pick up like dirt or dust, like maybe mushrooms or uh, like kale, like you can see here, those ones, I mean, personally, maybe you don't care, uh, but I think they work better with a produce bag items like a banana. Like we really don't need uh, a plastic bag for a banana or oranges or apples. You know, they have like a, they have their own packaging on compostable packaging on the outside where like an apple is pretty easy to wash zucchini. Um, broccoli, I or green beans, I think I'd prefer to put into a produce bag. What else is in my fridge? Potatoes, I don't. Potatoes, you put them right in. Like it's easy to uh, to wash those out. 
Okay, what's next here? Okay, uh, uh, yeah, so Vermont maple syrup, you can get that at bulk at many gross, at mo many bulk uh, co op, bulk section of many co ops. I'm going to make a plea to also include not just uh, the dark ones, but also uh, the amber, because that's the one I like, I like more. So that's selfishly, that's the one I want. Um, more nuts. Spices, you also get spices. Something I find pretty interesting is like if you buy spices in a um, like if you buy cinnamon in a container, you can just uh, you can just refill it when you get over there, and that seems to work pretty well. And then it's labeled because you you know you have to know what it is. Coffee, uh, dried fruit, and then also this is not a co-op but a refillable water station is uh, is a really you know great thing to see at any cafes. Um, all right, here is, did I not get them? Here we, here is, hang on. Oops. Does this thing work? Uh, this is my son helping me with uh, maple syrup. Did you do the maple syrup for you? Yeah, I'm doing maple syrup. <laughs> all right. You have to let go soon, okay? Just hold on. I'll tell you when. Back up a little so Daddy can see. All right. All right, uh, we're almost there. And all right, that's good. Let go. Good job. Did you the maple? So as you can see, this kid's a real pro. Uh, getting trained, getting trained young here. Uh, all right, here we go. Here's this thing again. All right, uh, next one up is uh, reusable coffee systems. It is a good idea to bring your own mug. Um, I think that's a great start, but I personally don't want to carry around a wheelbarrow of uh, jars and um, and mugs and produce bags all the time uh, to not feel guilty all the time to feel, not to feel guilty about going to the grocery store i think that um, having it what's nice about like plastic bags or paper bags at the grocery store is that they're already there like you don't have to bring it yourself you don't have to remember it they've taken they made it easy for you so um something that i would like to see happen in the upper valley or in vermont really anywhere but i live here so i feel like i may be able to have um some influence as to what's happening in this area is uh, reusable coffee like wouldn't it be great to go to uh, montvert um and then be and then they give you your coffee in a reusable mug and then you can return it at like multiple locations throughout throughout woodstock what else about that um yeah that would be really great to see um and i hope maybe this will help that happen um there is a company called muse that's uh, based on the west coast and they're doing reusable coffee mugs in lots of places it's a uh it's a, like a cup share program so the way it works is that a customer requests coffee in a reusable mug the customer borrows a, reu a reusable mug via muse app or a cash deposit customer drops off their cup or container at a return station or manned kiosk and then muse will collect uh, commercially clean and sanitized. So this is kind of what uh, this is kind of what it looks like in action. There is they partnered with Starbucks actually, which is a great gig for them. Uh, not at all their Starbucks, but at one location. I don't know where this is, but um, yeah, I'll show you how you know this is how it works. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's reusable coffee cups, uh, something I would like to see around this around this part of the state. All right, lastly, something that I know quite a bit about is um, the Vermont Can Carrier Reuse Program. So I started this program in November of 2021, and uh, so I'm a beer drinker, and I've seen these, and I'm always 
my mind is always thinking about like how can we start doing reuse at scale and I was actually living at we were living at my in-laws place my wife's family and I saw these and I was like oh like I think it would be great to uh, to reuse these but I was just like too afraid to go to a brewery and say hey would you think about reusing these um, so I stopped I stopped and then I heard about this guy doing a reuse program, reuse and recycling program in Massachusetts. Um, his name is Rob Van Denebeel. He has a, um, a blog called ecofriendlybeerdrinker.com. And he had this great thriving program in Massachusetts. And I asked him if um, we could bring this to Vermont. Um, like, would, would he help me? Because I didn't have like, you know, the moral support or any expertise, expertise in it at all. But I knew it was working somewhere. And you know, I wanted to try to get it happening in Vermont. So we started this program in November of 21, and then we did a pilot for a couple months uh, that was sponsored by Casella. And then um, we were able to expand it to the rest of the state with the support of Lawson's, Muscoma Bank, uh, the Woodstock Community Trust acted as a, a fiscal fiscal a fiscal agent here. So that was very helpful. And Lawson's, Muscoma, oh, Suncommon, the uh, the solar company also helped sponsor to bring it to the whole state. So now there's 60 locations throughout Vermont, and this is how it works. Uh, we call it the reuseverse for plastic can carriers. Uh, the consumers return the carriers to collection points throughout the state. Uh, the carriers are delivered back to the breweries. The brewers clean and reuse them, and there's less plastic waste in the environment. So now I'm going to show you guys. Uh, you know my my own highlight reel actually before i do that i'm going to show you the map so this is every place you can drop off can carriers uh, throughout vermont in this area um, there's two places in woodstock the village butcher and village butcher woodstock farmers market and then a little further to the east in queechee uh, jake's queechee market and then in norwich you can bring it to dan and wits and white river junction uh, the co-op food stores. So, you know, we're forever grateful for the support of all these collection places and having everybody work together to make this happen. Um, so that's that. Uh, here is my own highlight reel of the Reuse program. So I guess this is Lawson's. Uh, this is like the return, uh, the sign of the return bin. Uh, Green Empire, this is them cleaning their can carriers in a mash tun. It's like a big tub, and they're just using that to clean. Uh, we didn't see anyone do that before. It's pretty pretty clever, I must say. This is Vermont Beer Shepherd, our partner. Um, this is them picking up the can carriers to bring back. This is another location, a zero-waste store in Burlington that is a collection site. Uh, this is Vermont Beer Shepherd. Uh, this is them collecting those can carriers on a pallet. You, we collect about 10000 a month. Middlebury Food Co-op is a collection point. Uh, Bill McKibben tweeted about it. That was, you know, one of those I can die happy now. Uh, Putney Food Co-op is another location. Um, Vermont Beer Shepherd. So this is about what they collect per month. That's about 10,000 can carriers. Uh, Waste Dive article. A industry trade magazine could plastic beer can carriers be a gateway to the reuse economy I hope so I am really hoping that that is the case this is a Vermont beer shepherd again with uh, a pallet full of can carriers uh, this is this is a money shot for me just seeing you know I've seen this guy he's in what he comes to Woodstock too they they the whenever they're um whenever they're doing their deliveries for the beer they're picking up Whatever they're doing the deliveries for the beer, they're also picking up the can carriers. So no extra carbon emissions are being added onto their routes because they're already going there anyways. And that's a big one for me. And there's just so much collaboration happening here that it's it's cool to see. It's uh it's really been a joy to, you know, get this started and maybe this is the way that we can get more reuse happening for other things you know there's no reason we can't be reusing more we just have to like have the imagination and the will to make it happen so that's the end of my presentation i'll stop sharing um it looks like there's probably some questions in the chat um do you want to feed them to me uh, in ginevra
I'm more than happy to. I mean, I'll read this one to you, but Michael, our director, has already done one response. But um, some Debbie asked, how do you get the tear weight for a cotton produce shopping bag? Michael recommended weighing it at home or at the store and writing the weight on it. But I'll... That's, that's good. These ones actually have the tear on there. So it comes with a tear weight on it. And, you know, they're not that heavy. So even if it, even if they don't have a tear function, unless I don't know, unless you're buying truffles, I think truffles would be a very uh, you really want to make sure you get your tear rate tear weight figured out. But for other things, it just might, it might add like just a couple cents on there. Um, and then just some comments about the bags, and that Woodstock hops and barley has reusable glass bottles they fill with beer from the store. So that's an interesting one. I've done that a few times. Like, I think people are not doing that enough where the quality of the beer stays. Like I've done it a couple times and like the keg, the keg kicked and it was like bottom of the barrel. Um, yeah, I, I did it and I, I was going to say I was like a little disappointed with the results of that. But the zero, I like the idea. I really like the idea. I want it to succeed. I'm not a beer drinker, so I wouldn't know. Um, Dana says, are the recycling numbers include money back items? I'm not exactly sure what that means. I think I know what you mean, like uh, deposit systems. Uh, yeah, um, for like aluminum cans, not every state has the, you know, the bottle deposit over here. So, but in Vermont, we have a bottle deposit. It's a uh, five cent, is it five cents? They, may, they might be going to 10 cents soon, or like there's some legislation about that. Um, hard liquor also has a deposit on it which is great the deposit systems is like it's one of those things that definitely work even if it's 10 cents it's it's uh it is work it is working we should have that nationwide what's Thanks. next um well i'm just seeing if i missed anything <laughs> um is hunger mountain co-op yes one of the collectors they are one of the collectors, actually. Fred had commented that he thought so. Um, any other questions? And folks, you're welcome to unmute yourselves as well if you don't want to write in the... In yeah, the I need some other voices in here than just me. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is Debbie from Queechy. And uh, I've been a wishful thinker plastics recycler, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, What's a good resource for learning what things, um, is, is there like a graphic that will tell me what things I should be pulling out that I've been wishfully recycling? Just a, like a, um, a, a I thing. wish I had like a, I wish I had a resource that said, said that. Um, I can tell you off the top of my head, things that like, I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but things that are like, are not getting recycled, like top five that if you're looking to pull them out that like it's wishful and it's not going to happen is black plastic um that's not going to happen these can carriers there's lots of places to you can yeah. go to jake's peachy market so you don't have to, you can just do that you don't have to pull you can pull it out of your recycling and then put it into the bin at jake's peachy market yeah uh, i'm number, more thinking like clamshells certain products i like come in that clamshell Number Those six, number six plastic. You should just take it out yep. and save just, it, a, save it a trip. Or, or, or not get those anymore. Yeah, um, yeah. Wean myself off of certain products for and try to substitute others. I mean, the best thing you could do really is like, um, if you have the the will. I know it's hard. I find it hard too. Like even though I do this for work, just like approaching someone and asking them to change. Uh, it's it's hard. Maybe you can't, uh, but if you if you feel motivated to do that, like ask them to switch from, uh, you know, number six plastic to number one or number two plastic. Um, that those both would be better. And also not having black plastic. That's like the baseline. If you're really feeling motivated, like a clamshell, like that can be replaced with a reusable, um, a reusable. A takeout container. I work for this place in New York called Deliver Zero that does uh, delivery and reusable takeout containers. And you give it back to the delivery person or the restaurant when you're done using it and they'll wash it and they'll reuse it, which is like, that's like the dream is like, 
maybe not sweating so much about the recycling, but like how do we push reuse forward? And so reusable clamshells or takeout containers, that's the goal. So I think it's, it's important to remember that, not sweat, you know, the other stuff. But I guess in the meantime, all that's being developed. Um, yeah, some of those other, like just no number six plastic, no black plastic. Uh, those, are, those are the hot, those are the ones that are high on the list. Thanks, Ben. And we obviously, we, we must not have understood or answered your question, Dana, because you've come back and said, so again, do the numbers include money back items? Do you want to unmute um, and ask it in person, unless you have more thoughts on that, Ben? No, I, I, I thought I answered it, so. Oh, I, I guess I didn't hear it. Oh, yeah. yeah yes, it does include uh, money back items. So like anything with a deposit. Okay. Yeah, those numbers do include that. Wow. I think that's why like aluminum cans are are high on there uh, still, but not everyone has it. Like not every place has deposit systems. Like no, I know. it says it right on here, right? Like Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, New York, and Vermont, Hawaii, and uh, Iowa. Those are all right. the places. So that's only like a small portion of the country. But those numbers were for Vermont, correct? No, uh, no, this is nationwide. I don't oh, have that's right. okay. Yeah. Okay, so we might be a little bit better. We might be a little bit better. Yeah. Marginally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, Nina, you raised your hand. I don't know if. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Nina was fairly again. So I have two questions. Sure. Um, my first is my my husband's just curious to know: Is there any one country that leads others in plastics production? that you know of, just out of curiosity? Uh, I don't know offhand, but I know the U.S. is like very, it is very high. There's uh, in Louisiana, um, it actually has a, like a sad nickname. They call it Cancer Alley. Um, I forget, I forget where in Louisiana, but you know, Louisiana is close to all these oil refineries and plastic yeah. is made from oil. So all that, all of that is very okay. closely yeah. related. Okay. Um, I'd say the U.S. is, is pretty high. But I don't. I don't actually know. Um, okay. Classic. And my other question I have. I'm going to be bold and ask this rather okay. embarrassing question. But uh -huh. as a fellow Flatlander, you may understand this. Uh -huh. So we curb our dog, even though we live in Vermont, <laughs> uh -huh. and we pick up after it, and uh -huh. we with waste, and we try to re reuse plastic bags that we buy or. Is there a better way to do this other than, I mean, obviously I know a lot of fellow Vermonters just let their dogs roam loose in, in the woods and let them do their business. That's not possible for us for a number of reasons. So is there a more ecological way to dispose of pet waste than putting it in a plastic bag? Um, well, I don't have a dog, so I think it's hard for me to answer that, but I, I'm still going to try is, um, there are these biodegradable bags, but I, I don't really trust those. No, uh, we've looked into them and I don't find them to be very. I don't know. Maybe are there any other dog people on here that have figured it out? Because I I'm not really sh I mean, I guess if you like, I don't know, dog poop is compostable, right? Like, I don't know what conditions is compostable. Like, I don't know if you have to dig up. We, we wouldn't put it in hole. garden compost because depending on what you're putting it in, if you're putting it in, certainly wouldn't want to use it for vegetable gardens. Flower gardens, I'd still be pretty questionable with. Um, but what does everybody do? Yeah, yeah. Does anyone else <laughs> can you crowdsource an answer to this? Because I, I don't really know. Some brave soul. Maybe you want to talk about what you do for your dogs. Uh... I put myself out there with the dog poop. Someone's no, I, I, I appreciate well, that. It's, um... it's, yeah, if you, um, if you have access to municipal composting, um, which often you have to pay for, um, like a pickup service or even drop off, their compost gets pretty hot and usually it's okay to do things like dog poop. Um, but in a home compost system, no. No, I would never. In a comp no, right. No. Yeah. <laughs> but typically big municipal ones are, um, to my knowledge at least, okay. And I know people who have done that. Okay. And I do see in the comments, somebody put paper bags could be an answer. Um, that seems pretty solid. Yeah. Uh -oh. It kind of depends how much trouble you want to go to, but my cat litter, I would never put in the waste stream. I just take it out back and bury it. 
And that's another good point because we have a cat too. So that was another question with the, with the litter. What do we do with, you know, right now, right. like again, we're recycling our plastic bags that we get and we're disposing of it in the bags and then but putting it in the main waste stream. So that doesn't seem very effective to us. These would also be great questions for Ham Gillette, who is our um, broad waste and recycling guru. Um, but I want to make sure because we are at six twenty, so I'm going to keep going if you don't mind, because um, we have questions. In the I put Ham's. I'm sorry. I put Ham's email address in the chat if anybody wants it. Oh, great! Thanks, Thank Michael. You. Thank you. I'll reach out sure. to him. I appreciate the thoughts. So I think municipal composting. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any Upper Valley based nut or oat milk sources in reusable glass bottles or only cow milk? It's a really interesting question. That's a good one. As far as I know, I just know about uh, I just know about cow milk in reusable glass bottles. But you know, you can I think like part of my mission here is to like get people to start talking to the things they want to like companies that are that produce like the things you want and ask them to use reusables like it could be a short thing and saying like have you ever considered using reusable glass bottles for your oat milk and maybe they'll do it you know like if they get enough of them that's what we have to be after is like ch is change uh like from businesses and from the government uh to make these to make these things happen so i encourage you to find some email you know get the courage to just say hey uh would you you know i've seen lots i just saw this talk about you know zero waste in vermont like would you consider using reusable glass bottles for your own milk i would love to see that another question in the chat uh is well it's about outdoor clothing and sports are made from plastic fleece seems like a wonder fabric for outdoor enthusiasts but it produces plastic dust so any good ideas to encourage less plastic based clothing and move to cotton and wool for the outdoor clothing brands? That's good. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any, I don't have any great ideas for uh, like polyester. I mean, fleece, I think is polyester. Um, I don't, but I'll think about it. I mean, there's always campaigns you can plug into like, Sierra Club and um, 350.org, a lot of times they have campaigns about trying to get retailers to do a particular thing like uh, like PFAS. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that at all, but um, it scares me a lot because um, it doesn't break down at all. And it's used uh, to like waterproof things. A lot of compostable, compostable packaging has PFAS on it because, you know, uh, if you had a cup full of water and the cup was just made of paper i would do an experiment here but i got like carpet and i wasn't prepared for this but if you like put water in paper eventually the water is going to seep through because it doesn't have a, like a lining to stop the water from falling through that's like plastic as well as like the same idea is that plastic is used to line things in fact this aluminum can over here is lined with plastic um so to keep it it like I don't know exactly the science, but uh, it needs to be lined with plastic or else it like gets acidic and uh, gets into your drink. So uh, this has a plastic lining in it. And uh, what I was trying to say was PFAS is like, uh, it coats things so to make them waterproof. And some companies like REI, for instance, have like hiking pants that are lined with PFAS to keep it, to make it waterproof. But then you're dealt, then you have all this PFAS in the environment, which you don't want. So there is a campaign I saw one from Sierra Club um, to ask uh, REI to stop using PFAS in their clothing. That's about the closest thing that I have in mind f for something like that. Um, thanks, Ben. And we, I uh, want to make sure we get Paul's question. You addressed it a little bit, but um, do you see any need for new policy or legislation, or can we get the job done through changing our own behaviors and volunteer collaboration? That's a great question. It's really like all of the above, right? Like I think this vol like volunteer collaboration will hopefully lead to policy change. Uh, policy change is like, you know, if the government says like you can't do this anymore, that is the most effective thing. But it is a very depressing 
uh, line of work to be in to try to get policy change happening. You know, anyone that's been in the environmental movement for like the last 10 years is like, you know, getting any sort of getting people even to like acknowledge that climate change is a problem. Like the Green New Deal, that's kind of what got me into this. Like so it was like 2018, I think. Um, like pe getting people to even acknowledge there's a problem is is difficult right and so to get people not only to acknowledge there's a problem but to take sweeping actions that have never been done before you know uh bill mckibben like relates it and naomi klein related to like world war ii like full-scale mobilization to fight climate change um to get those kind of things happening it's it's like there's lots of people not even when people are not even acknowledging that climate change is the problem trying to like get sweeping legislation to combat climate change seems like impossible so i think that all these i all these different things need to work together so you know sustainable woodstock you know is an organization that's putting this on and then is also running a bunch of different programs to hopefully get people engaged uh in the process and i'm hoping that spills over to the policy side so i don't think that individual action is enough um it shouldn't get you down but like i did this i you know volunteered with sustainable woodstock to do the window dressers community build and i i, I mean i loved it i thought it was a super fun uh activity and you get to like meet your neighbors and engage with people so uh, i think that all these items work together to hopefully create that change um and i know we're getting low on time i'm just looking I'll, I'll make sure we get brenda's comment and question here um because i think it's, the other ones are more comment related than questions but um brenda wrote wondering about moving these techniques from the voluntary and willing people to eventually the industrial scale i work at dhmc and i'm working a project on my unit to improve compliance with the recycling systems they already have set up it's a slog for many reasons any thoughts about going bigger um well dhmc you know medical waste is huge right um anyone that's ever like taken a covid test or like 15 covid tests like on a very microscopic scale like you know it's just like everyone in the country is taking a covid test you know and they're probably taking like four or five of them and like that's a lot of waste just in like one sector so i, I don't know if you're asking about me trying to get bigger or the you know, I, I, I'm not handling medical waste. I'm, I'm very, I'm just, very, get my blind. I'm not even talking about medical waste. I'm talking about the single stream recycling buckets that we have for everything from, you know, juice containers to coffee cups. People just want to throw their, draw their trash in it, even when it's clearly labeled and right next to the trash. It's just, you know, it's an education. It's a motivation problem. Just, you know, working with the voluntary and willing is great, but what are your thoughts about persuasion? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, education, like if you can, you can get them to come to a talk like this, you know, like, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good place to start, you know, if like you're motivated to you know, put something together at DHMC, uh, you know, just educating people about what it is and clear signage is, is really important. But yeah, you got to talk to people. Um, and if you ever want to put on a presentation there, I'm happy to speak at it. Good to know. Thank you. Sure. Um, we're at 6.30. I want to um, say that everyone, people in the chat were talking about a meter to show people how much plastic they're using in their daily lives, which I think is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael, did I miss anything here in these comments? Oh, you're muted, Michael. You're still muted, Michael. I'm muted, Michael. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yeah. I so I just put something in the link about contacting your legislators in Vermont if you have some policy things that you might be wanting to encourage them to um, focus on in introducing bills and, and legislation, et cetera. Um, um, there's one I'll mention uh, that's, a, I think, a really good bill called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Um, I can get back to you with the... Uh, like the bill number and everything, but that's a fairly comprehensive bill to get. Um, there's like, there's like to, to get recycling happening and to try to, the big thing is uh, extended, called extended producer responsibility. Like right now, like 
uh, I have this soda, I have this beer can, and I uh, I put it in my recycling, and the person who made this can, it's not their responsibility to make sure that this gets recycled or pay for it or to share the cost of it. Right now, it's all on me, so I'm buying this, but I'm also paying to throw it out either if I, you know, uh, if I hire Casella to come pick it up or, um, you know, if, it, if it's town-sponsored, like then you're paying taxes to the town and the town's budget is like X amount of dollars for recycling. And the idea with uh, this bill or part of this bill, you know, the idea of extended producer responsibility is that it shifts the cost from the consumer or taxpayer onto the businesses that are making that product. And that's going to make them, you know, think twice about designing products that are not easily recyclable or reusable. Um, I, if, if you guys have like a list of registrants, I'll find that and I, I can send it to you if you guys want to forward it on later. Yeah, I'm happy to forward any info on to folks who registered or who are going to watch the recording, um, which I'll send out to everyone who has signed up. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's it, right? Yeah, I think that's it. If anybody wants to keep talking and do breakout rooms, uh, I am happy to stay on and chat some more. Um, I don't know, this is kind of a fun opportunity to meet like-minded people that are interested in zero waste. So I'll stay on and do you know how to do that, um, Ginevra? Oh yeah, I mean, I can make you the host and leave you on. Um, yeah, I guess we can do that. That's probably even easier than Easiest, the, yeah. The, but yeah. Um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us and for- Yeah, thank you, Ben, and thanks to everybody. So willing to talk. Um, and yeah, it looks like Nina might wanna ask you some more things here. Um, but I, I won't keep any anyone, anyone past. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And I'll send out your contact info too, Ben. So if people yeah, want to reach out to you directly, they can do that as well. Cool, great. Yeah, thanks, uh, Geneva and Michael with Sustainable Woodstock for putting this on. This is a thank lot you. of fun. Welcome. Have a good night. You too.